I pray that this word falls on solid ground. Lord, good ground, fertile ground. Lord, that those that are listening at this very moment in the sanctuary or online watching this video at, at any moment, whether live or a week or a year from now, Lord, that it will bless them, strengthen them to know you, Lord Jesus. Lord, we thank you for your word is everlasting and life is found only in you, Lord. So Lord, rebuke every demonic power that would try to distract us and would try to infiltrate your word. Lord, let the enemy not steal this. Let it grow deeply within us and glorify your name. It's in the name of Jesus Christ we pray. And all of God's people said, amen. amen. At this time, if you do not mind, would you please make sure your phones or cell phones are silenced, please? Uh, out of respect to the Lord Jesus Christ, I thank you for that. This morning, I would like to talk to you about a message entitled, In Light of Eternity. Now, there's a book that I read. It's about this thick. And I read this book, and it was a, a, a biography or autobiography. I don't know the difference. <laughs> but it's written on the life of Leonard Ravenhill. Uh, Leonard Ravenhill, who was a, a great uh, saint in the Church of Christ. Uh, he was born, I believe, in around 1906, somewhere around there. And he died in 1994. Uh, he was from England, and he... Uh, he traveled the world many times over uh, where he finally came to, um, to call Texas his home. He had seen so many uh, places in the world, but he loved Texas. So go figure, a man from England wanted to be a Texan. Amen? Amen. And so he loved Texas, and um, he uh, passed away eventually at his home in Texas. Um, but Leonard Ravenhill was a man that was just no... Uh, I never met him, but I've seen tremendous amounts of videos. I've read books that he's written. Uh, I, I honestly can say um, Leonard Ravenhill is one of the very few men or women of God in the last 150 years. Um, he's one of very few select people who have greatly influenced many, many countless ministries and ministers. Um, so many people to this very day uh, uh, thank the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, they thank for, for Leonard Ravenhill for what he has done. Uh, the man lived um, in light of eternity. Everything he did was for the glory of God and was for the benefit of, of eternal treasure. He, he did not like to waste uh, precious time. And the Word of God says, do not cast your pearls to the swine. And what that means is, as a Christian, your time, talent, and treasure is very precious and valuable. And do not just cast it anywhere. Make sure that you are sowing your time, talent, and treasure on fertile ground to people that are willing to hear. And you know, um, I've read his book about his life, and it, it is an incredible life. And you can see Jesus all through his life. And I thank God for that. And so if you ever would like to read a book, it's called In Light of Eternity. Uh, it's the life of Leonard Ravenhill. But here's what I want to say about this. When we live, when I talk about in light of eternity, everything you do, you have to understand, okay, I'm doing this today. What will this mean for eternity? You know, everything you do has consequences. And those consequences can carry out into eternity. Now, I want you to understand something. Eternity is beyond our time. It is not within our time. Eternity can exist, look, not only outside the realm of time, we are in the realm of time. But eternity can exist outside the realm of time as well as inside the realm of time. Eternity has no beginning and no end. Eternity has always been and always will. Who is eternal? Who? God. God is eternal. The Son is eternal. And what I would like to speak to you this morning is not just a preaching, but also a teaching message. Now, you can go to the dictionary and you can get lost in some of these words. I hope that does not happen today. But the word eternal and the word everlasting, they say are basically the same, but yet they're not. At the end of this message, you can come to your conclusion because you can definitely twist some wires up in your head. 
<laughs> with these two words. Eternal is without beginning or end, always existing, lasting forever. Amen? Everlasting means it's lasting forever, lasting for a very long time, for an indefinitely long time. And some also say that everlasting means that there is a beginning point. There is a beginning point. Some argue on that, some do not. But I'm just letting you know that that is the difference. Eternal has no beginning, no end. But everlasting has a beginning point of something. But it is also forever. So, again, like I said, eternity can exist outside the realm of time as well as inside the realm of time. And that is where we are. One day, one day, we, we because of the Spirit of God that is in us, we can live in eternity for everlasting. Amen? We are, well, we were not from eternity. God is from eternity. He is eternal. He has no beginning or end. We have a beginning but we will have no end if we are in Christ. Now, even for those who live and are found at the judgment of God to be worthy of the lake of fire, they are, will live everlasting as well. And so as human beings, we have had a beginning. Angels, they had a beginning. They are not eternal beings. They are from everlasting. And so this is something that we have to understand because look, look at John 3.16. This is where we understand more deeply this. You know John 3.16 where it says, For God so loved the world, amen, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have what? Everlasting life. Only the King James and the New King James Version record the word Everlasting. Every other Bible translation records as eternal life. But you see, there is a difference between those things, I believe. Now, that is my opinion. And many of the world dictionaries say that there is a difference as well. See, because we, are in, we will have everlasting life, meaning because we have now entered into a relationship with Christ, we will live forever. Okay? God is eternal. But this message of salvation, what we inherit, it's everlasting. Look, look at also um, verse 36, John 3, verse 36 says this. Look, Jesus goes on to say, He who believes in the Son has everlasting life. And he who does not believe in the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. So you see in this scripture here in verse 36, if we believe in the Son, we have everlasting life. Look, do you see what that is saying? That we can attain everlasting life right now as we live on this earth. It is in us already. We are already having everlasting life. Our names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Do not walk away from this. We are experiencing that. What does the Bible say? There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For those who are in Christ Jesus are what? A new creation. We are a new creation, right? Because we are now in everlasting life. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. That is everlasting. So as a Christian, we are inheriting some of these things now. It is an honor and a privilege to be able to experience this life of Jesus Christ. This is what the gospel message brings to us. So he who believes in the Son has everlasting life. It does not say it will have everlasting. It says you have everlasting. All the translations, even in the Greek, is very clear. It says that you attain it now. It doesn't mean that we're perfect. That, that is a process known as sanctification through the Holy Spirit. We go through a daily process of being sanctified through the Spirit of God, learning and growing to, 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 to walk with Jesus daily. But we are inheriting some things. We are inheriting the dwelling of the Holy Spirit within us. Amen? You do not have to wait until you die as a Christian and go to heaven and then see the Holy Spirit or be, uh, have the experience of the Holy Spirit. No, you have that now. He is in you. He is from eternity living in you, bringing you everlasting life. Amen? Amen. Look at John 17, verse 3 through 4. And this is eternal life. Look, 
This is not everlasting life. This is eternal life. Look at the difference in what this says. That you may know that they, the people, may know you. Jesus is saying this. Jesus is saying that the people may know the Father, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. That right there, my friend, that is eternal life. Who is eternal life? The Father and the Son. Because they have no beginning and they have no end. They are the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus is eternal life. God is eternal life. This is eternal life. That you may know them. If we know them, we know the eternal life. And we are inheriting everlasting life. Look, Jesus says in verse 4, He says, I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work which you have given me to do. Jesus lived in light of eternity. He came from eternity and he was existing in the realm of our history as eternity and he was returning back to eternity. It's incredible. You know, w there are things that exist that our eyes cannot see and our ears cannot hear. That's called in the supernatural realm. Angels and demons, they exist in those places. You know, my, my, I can talk to Pastor Prabarker in India with my cell phone here right now, and that it's going through the airwaves all the way to India. How can that be? There are things that, that man has able, through the wisdom of God, has been able to tap into to some incredible, incredible things, incredible technology. But I'm not talking about technology. What I'm talking about here is I'm talking about eternity. I'm talking about the eternal things of God. That's what I'm talking about. Amen? That's what I'm talking about. Amen. And so when we see in John chapter 5, verse 24 through 25, look what it says here. It says, Most assuredly, I say to you, Jesus says, He who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment but has passed from death into life now just keep that up there for a moment as you read that there are people that are alive on this earth but yet because they do not know Jesus they are in death they are under judgment and this is why Jesus Christ came he came to free them from the wages of sin which is death he came to bring them everlasting life, to be free from eternal separation from God. This is why the world is filled with violence and chaos, because they are already in death and destruction. Do you know why the devil hates you? I mean, think about it. You go on, uh, human beings are under some of the most harshest realities of, of the world addictions of many kinds, evil acts of many kind. We, 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 we kill, steal, and destroy each other. And that's not just because it's our nature, but it's because there is one behind the scene who is pushing that agenda to kill each other, and that is Satan. Satan wants us to destroy ourselves. Why? Because God loves you, and Satan hates God. God loves you. For God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever will believe in Him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. As a human being, you will live forever. Where? That is up to you. God has prepared a place, once you leave this world, to where people who do not want to have anything to do with God, go. It is known as the lake of fire. But to those who have repented of their sins, they're willing to surrender to Christ and to walk with Christ all of the days of their life. The Lord, in John 14, says, I go away to prepare a place for you. Where there is no more death, mourning, no more pain, no more misery. You see, we, you and I cannot understand that a place like that even exists right now. You want to know why? Because all we've ever known is this earth that we live on. But if you know that beyond the universe, beyond this realm of time that we're in, is eternity, 
And that is where the throne of God is. And God is luring you. He's not deceiving you. He's luring you. He's drawing you. What does the Bible say? Draw near to me and I shall draw near to you. God is drawing you. God is working on you. He's whispering to you, even right now. He's telling you to repent and to come to him because he loves you, because he can save you. And he wants you in eternity to live everlasting life. This life that we know is temporary. 70, 80, 90 years, that's it. We are in a temporary place making eternal decisions. What you choose now, you will have to remain with for everlasting life. Verse 25 says this, Most assuredly I say to you, Jesus says, The hour is coming and now is when the dead will hear and the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. He's talking about all people on the earth. In the eyes of God, you are dead in your sin. But when you hear the voice of God, when you hear Christ, you become alive in Him. There is a new creation for those who are in Christ. And this is everlasting life. And the message is called In Light of Eternity. And that's, you, many of you, and watching online, you can say, well, I'm a Christian. Yeah, I believe I follow the Lord. But you see, your, your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ does not just end at confession. You, you are to live in light of eternity. When you go to your job, when you go to the store, in your dealings with people, family, friends, acquaintances. You know, when, when you're dealing with people, what you do can carry over into eternity. Everything you do, you should do with a mindset of how, how will this mean something in eternity. You know, Leonard Ravenhill said it. He said it perfectly. He said it like this. On his gravestone, it actually says this. It says, Are the things you're living for worth Christ dying for? What you're doing today, was it worth Jesus dying for you? Hanging out at the bar. Cheating in your, in, your, in your company finances. Whatever it may be. You don't have to be an addict. You don't have to be a, a homeless person to be, to, to, be, to be living in disobedience to God. Just because you're homeless doesn't mean you're living in disobedience to God. Absolutely not. You remember the story of the homeless man who died and he was in the presence of God. See, y your riches cannot get you into the kingdom of God. It's a, a broken and contrite heart for those who are tired of, of their sin. They're repentant of their sin. And that's living in light of eternity. Look, Jesus is looking at your heart today. There is no fooling the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. He loves you. He wants to show you a life that you never thought could exist. And it's everlasting life. I haven't always been a preacher. There was a time in my life I never wore a suit in my life. Why do I wear a suit today? Not because I'm religious, but because when I go before the king and present his word that he died for, I want to look my very best. That's why I wear a suit. I've had several Christians in my life tell me, why do you get dressed up? You don't need to wear a suit. No, I don't need to, but I want to. Because I serve a great king, a mighty king, who deserves the very, very best of what I can give. And so if I'm wearing a nice suit, how much more should I be on the inside? Amen. Presentable to Him. Amen. 2 Corinthians 4, 16 through 18 says this. It's, Paul is telling the church, he says, Therefore, we do not lose heart. Even though our outward man is perishing, the out of your body, amen? Yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. You cut yourself. A deep cut, it'll leave a mark because your body is decaying. You do not brush your teeth. They're going to fall out one day. Amen? Amen. Amen? You do not take a shower. You're going to stink. Amen? Amen? Our body is decaying day by day on the outside. 
but on the inside. That is the most important, and that is what the Lord is looking at. That is what Scripture says. Let's read it again. Therefore, we do not lose heart, verse 16, even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. For our light affliction, meaning the troubles we're bearing right now, which is but for a moment, we're not going to be on this earth forever, it's just a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Meaning the trials, the troubles that you go through as a Christian in this world, it's to make you pure and presentable before God. It's going to honor Him. You're going to receive some eternal treasures that were definitely more than worth it than what you went through on this earth. Verse 18, While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary. Look to the person next to you and say, this body you're in, it's temporary. Amen? And some of you can say amen, right? Amen. Right? You're a little, putting a little more weight over the years. Lost some hair. You missed that hair. I missed my hair. I remember uh, last week my son Michael got his head shaved. And I'm, I'm, he had so much hair. And I said, man, I remember when I was your age, I had a head full of hair. And now it's like, if I look down, which I'm not, now you're going to be looking. You're going to see all the thinness up here. For the things which are seen are temporary. Verse 18, but the end of verse 18. But the things which are not seen are eternal. You cannot see what's in you. But you know it's there. You cannot see God, but you know He's there. You cannot see the wind, but you see the effects of the wind when it hits the trees and the flowers and it hits your face. So everything is by faith. Everything is by faith. And as a Christian, we should live in light of eternity. Everything I do, what is it going to mean in eternity? Am I leaving a legacy? Am I leaving a name for Jesus Christ. When I leave this world as a Christian, when I leave this world as a Christian, what will they say about Jesus? The work he did in my life. Look. Look at ver, uh, Luke 23, verse 47 through 49. Jesus had just died on the cross. And the Bible says that when he died on the cross at that very moment, there was an earthquake in Jerusalem. And around the cross of Jesus, there were so many people. Look what it says. So when the centurion, that's the Roman soldier, the officer, saw what had happened, he glorified God saying, certainly this was a righteous man. The other gospels say, certainly this, was, this is the Son of God. Verse 48, And the whole crowd who came together to see that sight who? The sight of this man on the cross, Jesus. Seeing what had been done, they beat their breasts and they returned. But all of his acquaintances, Jesus, his, 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 uh, his people that followed him, and the women who followed him from Galilee, they stood at a distance watching these things. You see, when Jesus died, see, Jesus lived in light of eternity because he was from eternity. And in a sense, we have eternity in us because Christ is in us as a Christian. But when Jesus died on the cross, it struck the hearts of those people. At the moment that he died, they realized they were wrong. That they got this man wrong. And what does the Bible say? Live your life in such a good way that even unbelievers cannot dare bring an accusation against you. That they will glorify God on the day of his visitation because of you. You're living in light of eternity. That when you leave this world as a follower of Christ, it's going to strike the hearts. You know, I've been to several Christian funerals where this Christian died and went to be with the Lord. And the people that came to the funeral, they were struck by the word of God. Because they saw the testimony of Christ in this man. Or this woman. I've been to funerals like that. Anna and I have been to funerals like that. And this was, in a sense, today is a funeral. You come to church to die. To die to yourself. To die to this world so that you may be alive to Christ. Amen. 
Because if, there, if you don't have that, then you're lost for eternity, for, for everlasting life. And this is not God's plan for you. The centurion became a believer. The people who beat their breasts, what does that mean? They beat their breasts. It means they had remorse for what they, they thought was right was actually wrong. Their hell, one day the lake of fire, is going to be filled with people who will be beating themselves, asking for another opportunity. And we know this because of the story that Jesus talks about, about the rich man who went to hell. That, that he, the first thing he asked for was a glass of water. He was selfish. He was still thinking about the needs of himself. And then he began to think about his brothers. He said, tell someone to warn them. He said, hey, they've got Moses. They have the word. They have the prophets. Let them hear them. Every person that has died and gone to hell or to the lake of fire, I'm telling you, the most famous name in heaven and earth Heaven and heaven and hell is Jesus. That name is repetitious, repetitiously said in hell. Jesus, I'm sorry. And then they begin to curse Jesus. The Bible, Jesus says that there will be weeping and gnashing of the teeth. Why? That they will have regret because they did not live in light of eternity. Look, you what you're doing on this earth determines where you will live for eternity, for everlasting life. Do not take this lightly. If you're watching online, you've heard this message before, but let me tell you something. This may be the last time you hear this message. Yeah. I'm going to just read something because I want it to soak in. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 3 through 12, and just bear with me. Let me just read this. Again, I'm talking about living in light of eternity. That's what I'm talking about. It says here, we are bound to thank God always for you, brethren. This is Paul talking to the church. As it is fitting, because your faith grows exceedingly, and the love of every one of you all abounds towards each other. Is that us at this church today? Look at that. Are we growing in faith? Are we growing in love for one another? Amen? Verse 4. So that we ourselves boast of you, among the churches of God for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that you endure, which is manifest evidence of the righteous judgment of God, that you may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you also suffer. Since it is a righteous thing with God to repay with tribulation those who trouble you. Look at verse 6. It is a right thing for God to repay with tribulation those who trouble the church. That's why the church will not be here when the wrath of God falls on the earth. Because it is a righteous thing for God to repay them with tribulation. Do you see that? Revelation 3.10 says, Because you persevere, you endure. I will keep you from the hour of trial that will come upon the whole earth to test them. Whatever you're going through, Jesus is worth it. The pain, the sickness, the, the, the false accusations, whatever it is, the hurt, it's worth it. Jesus is worth it. This life is just for a moment. Be wise with your life. Don't end up in hell in a place of eternal separation because you listen to foolish people. Because you were bound by, by drugs. Because you were bound by money, by greed, by, by lust. All those things do not exist in the kingdom of God. So therefore, be done with them now as you live on the earth. Because if, if that is a desire of your heart to be with God, understand that those things do not belong in His kingdom. They do not exist in His kingdom. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. And this is what flesh and blood experience day in and day out. The hurt, the pain, the persecution, working hard under the sun, by, uh, earning by the, the sweat on your brow. 
Those are things. That, that's what, isn't that what God told Adam? Because you sinned, you're now going to have to toil the ground by hard blood, sweat, and tears. Hard work. But in the kingdom of heaven, there's no death. There's no pain. There's no crying. There's no sun. There's no moon. There's no sea. Because we will not need the need of the sun or of the moon. We will have eternal treasures because we, la we, we chose to lay down the life of sin to inherit the salvation of God. And the Bible says in 1 Corinthians that the message of the cross, look behind this screen is, the, is, is, an, is a wooden cross. And the Bible says that the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Now, it's, people think that you wear a golden cross or a wooden cross on your neck that you've got the power of God. No, that's not what it is. The message of the cross is that you've repented of your sin, that you receive forgiveness of your sins, and that you live Christ as Christ lived for you. That is the message. That is the power of God within you. And you have the ability as a Christian, as a Christian, and only a Christian has the ability to practice righteousness. As an unbeliever, we have no choice but to sin. As a Christian, you have the ability to sin, and the ability not to sin. Verse 7. Let, 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 again, let me go back to verse 6 and go through. Since it is a righteous thing with God to repay with tribulation those who trouble you and to give you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. These shall be punished with everlasting destruction. Well, why is it everlasting destruction? Why? Because look, I want to tell you something. Hell hasn't always existed. The eternal place of separation has not always existed. There is a beginning point. The Bible says that hell was created for Satan and his fallen angels, not for any human being. So that's why it's with everlasting destruction. It will cease to end. That, that you will never cease to end this damnation. Verse 7 again. And to give you who are troubled rest with us with the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. These shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power when he comes in that day to be glorified in his saints and be admired among all those who believe because our testimony among you was believed. And therefore we also pray for you that our God would count you worthy of this calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you and you in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. This is called living in light of eternity that God has done everything for you Christian that you just continually live in obedience and surrender to him. Look, as a human being, you naturally do not want to hear the word obedience. Am I right? I, I remember, and I always go back to this story because, you know, our kids. I remember when, when Mikey, I, I pulled away a, a, a spoonful of peanut butter from him. And he had a slobbering all over his mouth. And I took it away from him and he about went crazy. He started slamming his head on the floor. How old was he? About a year old, maybe? Yeah, and, and I'm thinking, oh my goodness, we are in trouble. <laughs> a couple weeks later, 
He's in his walker. Yeah, he must have been a little before because he started walking at a year old. And so he's in his walker. I guess 11, 9, 10, 11 months. And he's in his walker. And the same thing, I'm like, Michael, look at you. He had it peanut butter all the way down. And so I took that spoon away. And he just went crazy. He jumped up and down. And he started running. Then he hit his head in the refrigerator door on purpose. And banging his head on the refrigerator door because he was, he was mad because I took something away from him. He was angry. And so that's how we are with God. Just when we read the word of God, God, the word of God says, do not kill, do not steal, do not do this, do, right? And we're naturally, we're not going to kill and steal, but you can't tell me to, that I can't do this and do that. We just naturally want to disobey. You do not have to teach a child to, 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 to steal. A child naturally steals. A child naturally lies. A child naturally is greedy. When they're born, they're crying. Why? Because it's all about them and not about anybody else. They don't care that you were sleeping at 2, 3 in the morning. They wake up, they're crying because they're selfish. They want to be changed. They want to be fed because that's the sin nature within us. We are naturally sinful, wicked people. We know this, right? But that's why Christ came to pay the penalty of sin that everyone must pay. I am excused from that now. You are excused from that now. We do not have to deal with the wages of sin, which is death. We have been saved by the blood of Jesus. But it does not just end there. We are called as Christians to live in light of eternity. To live in obedience to Christ. And we don't like to hear that word, even as Christians. We don't like to hear that word. The pastor says, oh, let's come pray. Oh, let's come to Bible study. Well, those are just religious. No, they're not just religious things. There are things that will strengthen you, that will edify you that will grow you that bring accountability into your life look when you were a sports fan where'd you hang out at all the time nobody made you go to the bar nobody made you go to the minute Maid stadium you just went because you knew that's where the action was amen you like to drink and dance well, where'd you go you went to the dance hall amen that's right right because that's where the action is and now that you're a christian you want to go where what the action is Iron sharpens iron. There is power in the fellowship of the church. Amen. Christians hang out with Christians. Amen. We are to be separate from the world. We're not better than anybody else. No, we're not. God loves the unbeliever the same as he loves the pastor, the evangelist, the Christian. God loves us all the same. But there's just one difference. We're living in obedience and they're living in disobedience. And God is working on them just like he worked on you when you were at once in disobedience. Amen. But at the end of your life, God will honor what you decided. If you chose to live a life separate from him, he will bless you with eternal separation. God will always honor what you decide. Free will. He, all, he, have always, he gave it to Adam and Eve. Free will. He didn't make them. He told them, don't do this. Don't eat of that. And they disobeyed and sin came into the world. So nobody can say, God sent me to hell. You sent yourself. Because you did not live in light of eternity. You chose to follow the, the foolishness of your friends. You choose to follow the foolishness of this wicked society, calling evil good and good evil. And you see how it is now. This is what, what do they call it? Cancel culture? They call it that right now. They're, redefini they're redefining uh, genderism now, transgenderism. They've, re they've redefined it, uh, marriage already. They're continually killing innocent babies in the womb. And they all say that this is honestly good. And, and this is lovely. And this is right. When the Word of God speaks clearly that this is wrong. This is wrong. Look, you keep walking on the road to hell. One day you're going to walk into hell. You're called to live in light of eternity. Everything you do as a Christian, it's got to mean something. It's got to honor the one who is from eternity. In Galatians 6, 7 through 10, it says this. Paul says to the church in Galatia, now listen please, it says, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. Do you see that? He is talking to a Christian. And what can happen to a Christian? They can be deceived. A Christian can be deceived. Because we're still battling with this sin nature within us. 
though you may be forgiven of your sin, you're called to conquer this sin. You're called to master this. And it's through the Holy Spirit of God. If you could do it on your own, then Jesus didn't need to go to the cross. But Jesus went to the cross to pay the penalty of sin, to bring in the Holy Spirit into your life. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. This is called living in light of eternity. What you sow is what you reap. You, if you're a farmer, you sow corn seeds, watermelon seeds, that's what you're going to get. Don't expect to, to plant watermelon seeds and think oranges are going to come out of it. Right? You sow hate into the world, that's what you're going to get. But if you sow into the kingdom of God, you're going to reap the kingdom of God. If you sow goodness, purity, honesty, godly character, if you sow into these things, then you're going to reap good things. Amen? Amen. Amen. God will not be mocked. God will not be, it, this will not come back on, God, I tried to do this and you lied. God. No, God will not be mocked. God will not be ridiculed. He is true to his word. You reap what you have sown into the life of others. Verse 8, for he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the Holy Spirit, that's capital S, will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. Not eternal, everlasting. So we need to sow into the things of the Spirit of God, into the kingdom of God, into your life as a Christian. Verse 9, and let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Why is Paul saying this? Because every Christian at one point or another will become weary. They'll stop doing what they were called to do. They, they, will, they will, and I've been there, and I hope I'm never there again. But, but you start growing weary of these things. Now just remember this. If you start growing weary, if you start getting burned out, you know, burned out doing the Christian thing, what they say, then you are doing it in your own strength and not in the strength of the Lord. You should never be burned out walking with Christ. Never. If you do get burned out, maybe you were doing this in your own power. Because with God, all things are possible. We need to stop making excuses and start living in light of eternity. Verse 10. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the, of the household of faith. We should do good to all, but especially to the other Christians. That is our first priority. You want to know why Jesus says this? Why Paul says this? It's because I have two sisters by the blood of a man, our father. But what makes you and I, brother and sister in Christ, is by the blood of another man, Jesus. And his blood far outweighs the blood of men. You get what I'm saying? So though I'm obligated to honor my earthly family, I'm even more obligated to honor my heavenly family. Because my heavenly family is everlasting. And our earthly family is not always everlasting. So we are obligated to our heavenly family, to the church. We are to do good to all, but especially to those who are the household of faith. 2 Corinthians 5, 9 through 11, moving quickly, two more left. It says, therefore, Paul says, we make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be well-pleasing to God. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. This is a Christian, every Christian, that each one may receive the things done in this body, when we lived on the earth, according to what he has done, whether good or bad, Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are well known to God, and I trust also are well known in your consciences. There's nothing like having a clear conscience. But the Bible does tell us that one day we will stand before Jesus Christ, and we will have to give an accounting. This is called living in light of eternity. Everything we did. You know, some of you, maybe those online, you know what you ought to do, 
but you do not do it. You know what good you ought to do, but you do not do it. The book of James 4, 7 says that those who do that, it is sin. And so what has God called you to do? Are you doing this? Because in the end of the day, you're not doing this to men. You're doing this, you're serving unto the Lord. Jesus came because he loved us, but he came to honor his father. His father sent him here. And we are called to follow Christ. 1 Corinthians 3, 9 through 17 says this. Paul says to the church once again, he says, For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field. You are God's building. Amen? This church, this wood you see, that's not the church. Christian, you are the church. Amen? You are God's building. We just come together inside of this wood and this carpet. But that's not the church. You are the church. You are His hands. You are His feet. Verse 10. According to the grace of God, which was given to me, as a wise master builder, Paul says, I have laid the foundation, and another builds on it. But let each one take heed how he builds on it. Paul wrote 13 epistles of the Bible. That is what he is referring to. He helped laid the foundation of the church by being allowed to be used by the Holy Spirit to write 13 books of the Bible. And he was a master builder. And he did his part. But there are others that have to work on this too. Look, verse 11 says this, For no other foundation can anyone lay that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. So again, verse 11 says this. We see so many false religions in the world. They're not laying upon the foundation of Jesus Christ. There's a church called the Latter-day... Uh, what is it? Latter-day what? Latter-day Latter Saints of Jesus Christ. But they do not preach the Jesus of the Bible. As a matter of fact, they read another book called the Book of Mormon. Pray for them because they're lost. They're lost they're lost in deceit. There are so many religions in this world. Hinduism, Islam. And you know, these people are not our enemy. But they're lost with lies. They do not know the Jesus of the Bible. A lot of Christians will say, no, Islam worships the same God we do. Well, see, that Christian is wrong. Because Jesus says in the Bible, he who has the Son has the Father. He who does not have the Son does not have the Father. And Islam says that Jesus is not of the Father, that Jesus was just a great man. That was it. So they deny the very deity of Jesus. So we do not worship the same God according to Jesus. But do you see how living in light of eternity, when we die, our life should say something to these people. But sadly, the church is filled with so many people who are living selfish lives. They're not living a life that's truly honoring to God because if they were, would we see revival? Would we see people being breaking, breaking free of strongholds? Look, when Jesus came, when the disciples walked the face of the earth, they lived in light of eternity. And the Bible said countless people were demons had been cast out of them. Demons had been cast out of them. In the book of Revelation, it says that Satan has been cast down to the earth because he knows that his time is short and he has declared war on the saints of the Most High, those who hold to the testimony of Jesus Christ. So Satan has escalated his warfare against humanity because he knows his time is short. So if it was bad, demonic possession in the days of Jesus, how much more today? If there was power in the gospel to cast these demons out at the beginning of the church age, why, why are we not taking advantage of this now? Our streets are filled with, 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 with the generations that have, are filled with drugs, with, with fentanyl, with all these things, um, you know, you name it. All these drugs that are just destroying them. Because so many Christians today are so consumed by their own life, working their own jobs, tending to their own garden and that's it and that's why we do not see we do not see this great revival that we all claim to want to see because with with a revival comes sacrifice and we're not willing to do that 
for the church for the most part. I'm, I'm not talking about you in particular. I'm just saying for the most part, the church in America, we've bought into a false gospel, a prosperity gospel. We've bought into, we've bought into something that, that has nothing to do with, with everlasting life or with eternity. If the preacher says one thing wrong, but yet it's written from the word of God and you don't agree with it, then what? I'm a heretic. I'm a false teacher. <laughs> but what does the word of God say? And today they ask preachers, well, what is your opinion of homosexuality? What is your opinion of homosexual marriage? And these preachers today that are really not preachers of the pulpit, they give their opinion when they should say what the word of God says. Because the word of God stands on its own, not the opinions of men. No other foundation can be laid. Verse 12. Now, if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, and straw, each one's work will become clear, for the day will declare it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. Now, when we build in the kingdom of God, we're not talking about gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, or straw. You know, when you did a work, that was, had nothing to do, it, had, it was not going to bless you at all. You don't let your right hand know what your left hand is doing. You went and you served in that hospital. You went and you took, you visited the prisoners. You did something good and it was not going to, it had no kind of reward to you on the earth whatsoever. You were just sowing in. That's gold in the eyes of God. That's gold. That's gold in the eyes of God. Now you did something that, you know, it blessed you too. It blessed others, but it blessed you. That's copper. <laughs> That's silver. You know, because it was a little bit, you know, away, away from that gold. But it's still something you did for the kingdom of God as a Christian. At the judgment seat of Christ, of what we read in the scripture before, we all will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Not to be judged on whether we go to heaven or hell, but to be judged of how we lived in light of eternity. The treasures that we, we, as a Christian, we are storing up treasures in heaven. And when we die, we're going to get there and Jesus is going to say, come on up here, Dean. Oh, uh, bring his treasure. Here it is. All right, Dean, let the Holy Spirit fire hit it. Bam. And whatever stands the, the testing of the Holy Spirit, that is the true treasure. A lot of other stuff is going to be burned up because you did some work selfishly. Now, I'm not saying you did, Dean, okay, but I'm just giving an example. But, but you did some work selfishly. You, you, you got some things absolutely wrong. That's going to be burned away up. But here is the true treasure. Here is how you truly honor God. That's going to be a day of reckoning. You, you know, look, 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 look what verse 13 says. I'm sorry, verse um, yeah, 13. Each one's work will become clear. For the day will declare it because it will be revealed by fire. That's the Holy Spirit, I believe. And a fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. Verse 14. If anyone's work which he has built on it endures, he will receive a reward. Look at verse 15. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved. Yet as so through fire. You see that? Look, keep that up for a minute. If your work is burned up, you're going to suffer loss, but, you're not going to, but you'll be saved. You're not going to hell. This is the judgment seat of Christ. It does not determine whether you go to heaven or hell. That, that is the great white throne judgment for all unbelievers. This is the judgment seat of Christ. You will stand before Jesus and give an accounting of your life, Christian. Some of you may have one little bitty treasure. Some of you have great treasure. And it's not for you to have. But it's, it's to say at the end of that process, Jesus, this is how much I truly loved you. And this is how much I truly took your word to heart. I honor this. And you lay it at, at his feet. So don't think you're serving the pastor or the church. You're really serving Christ. Let people say what they're going to say. Let people do what they're going to do. Because one day, Christian, you're going to be face to face with your master. And you will have to give an accounting. Some of us have to play catch up. We've fallen way behind. But God is patient. Verse 16. As I close this. Do you know. Do you not know. 
that you are the temple of God. See, not this building. This building is not the temple. We're to honor God with this building, but you are the temple. Your body is the temple. And that the Spirit of God dwells in you, Christian. If anyone defiles the temple of God, Christian, hit yourself. If you dishonor God with this temple, God will destroy him. For the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. Honor God with your physical body. That's called living in light of eternity. Honor God with your body, with the life that you have on this earth, because he dwells in you. He paid a high price for you. And this is what we are called to do, to honor him, to bless his holy name. This message, I promise you, sadly, it is not preached in many churches at all today. But this is the word and word of God. All of this is what I have said today is in alignment with the Holy Bible. And so live in light of eternity. And guess what? And be blessed. Amen? Amen? Amen. Amen. Receive that word in Jesus' name. Amen. Give God praise in his house. He is worthy.